We've been going through the story of David uh, in 1 Samuel, and just like your life, these are just events that happened to David, and they are written down by humans, inspired by the Spirit, and have connections and implications into the New Testament, the New Covenant, and our lives as well. And it's interesting reading stories like this and thinking through about how these are humans that were in some cases, living for themselves, and others trying to please God in a complicated and broken world full of suffering and difficulty. And the point we're at, where we're at in the story right now is that David is on the run. He's been faithful to the current king, Saul, and yet Saul wants to murder him anyway and has already tried on multiple occasions. Saul's own children, Jonathan, uh, is David's best friend now, and, and he has chosen to remain faithful to David regardless of the orders of his father, the king. David's also married to Saul's daughter, Michal, who had lied to her father and his soldiers in order to hide David to get him out of the city safely. And David now also has the favor of the prophet Samuel, uh, who's God's spokesperson to the nation at that time period. And Samuel is even traveling with David. And so David, even though he's in exile and he's anointed to be the coming king, uh, he's running from the king, but God is already putting pieces uh, together. He's building almost the court of his future kingdom in which he's got the cooperation of the prince and the princess and a prophet and today he's going to encounter a priest in a somewhat tragic story. And so this is 1 Samuel 21, and here we go, we'll, we'll take it away. Then David came to Nob to Ahimelech the priest. And Ahimelech came to meet David trembling and said to him, Why are you alone and no one with you? And David said to Ahimelech the priest, the king has charged me with a matter and said to me, let no one know anything of the matter about which I send you and with which I have charged you. I have made an appointment with the young men for such and such a place. And so David is definitely lying here, okay? He's, he's lying to a priest. You probably would feel uncomfortable with that, right? But, but David is trying to, in some way, protect and spare the life of Ahimelech in case the wrath of Saul comes after him. Let's find out what happens. And so verse 3, now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever is here. And so David and his men are hungry. And the priest answered David, I have no common bread on hand, but there is holy bread if the young men have kept themselves from women. And David answered the priest, truly women have been kept from us as always when I go on an expedition. The vessels of the young men are holy even when it is an ordinary journey. How much more today will their vessels be holy? And so there's this sacred bread that's in the tabernacle, that's the bread of the presence before the Lord, and it's intended only for the priests. And Ahimelech is choosing to give this bread to David and his men because they're hungry, as an act of mercy, even though it wasn't according to the law and tradition. And so verse 6, the priest gave him the holy bread, for there was no bread there but the bread of the presence, which is removed from before the Lord to be replaced by hot bread on the day it is taken away. Verse 7, now this isn't the only two people involved in this moment. A certain man from the servants of Saul, the current king, was there that day, detained before the Lord. His name was Doeg the Edomite, the chief of Saul's herdsmen. And in case you're wondering, Doeg is not a, a Jewish individual. He's not from the people of Israel, but he's a related cousin, so to speak, from the house of Esau. You might remember the story of Jacob and Esau. Esau, his descendants formed the nation of Edom. And so he's there kind of watching this event take place. Verse 8, then David said to Ahimelech, then have you not here a spear or a sword at hand? For I have brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me because the king's business required haste. And so, once again, David is lying here, which we should be a little bit uncomfortable with. 
But stories up to this point in the scriptures, we already know that Rahab had lied to protect the spies that had come into Jericho. And she's commended for her, her faith, even in the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews. Uh, we read a few chapters ago how Michal had lied to the soldiers to protect and spare the life of David, pretending that he was sick when he had already escaped from the city. And now here in this moment, David is trying to spare the life of Ahimelech, giving him to some degree plausible deniability so that way when Saul comes and investigates that hopefully Ahimelech's life will be spared. Now in general, the, the teaching of the scripture is tell the truth, don't lie, and uh, chances are the many situations in which we would want to be like, well, yeah, but I'm trying to, chances are we're not in moments quite like this. All right, we're probably just trying to lie to protect our own reputation one way or another. Uh, and so, in general, don't, don't lie. Be honest people. Tell the truth. Have a good reputation that people can trust. Uh, so, verse 9, the priest said, uh, regarding this request for a weapon, he says, The sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom you struck down in the valley of Elah, behold, it is here, wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you will take that, take it, for there is none but that here. And David said, there is none like that. Give it to me. And so David has acquired food for him and his men. And now he's acquired this legendary sword from Goliath, right? The very giant that he had slain that had put his name on the right public display where people started to celebrate uh, his reputation and give him promotions and, and things like that. And so, so this is the first little story, just this merciful priest helping out David in a time of hunger. And we're going to actually fast forward to the next chapter where this particular story continues. And so this is 1 Samuel 22, verse 6. Now Saul heard that David was discovered. And the men uh, who were with, with him, uh, Saul was sitting at Gibeah under a tamarisk tree on the height uh, with his spear in his hand. And all his servants were standing about him. And so King Saul is out on the hunt for David. He's got many of his soldiers with him. And Saul said to his servants who stood about him, Hear now, O people of Benjamin, will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards? Will he make you commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds that all of you have conspired against me? And so Saul is now becoming paranoid. He's feeling the sense, right? He's, he's, he's recognizing that he's losing the kingdom. He's already lost the loyalty of his own son and daughter, and now he's suspicious of everybody and, and without cause, right? He's, he's actually saying, all of you have conspired against me. Verse 8 continues. He says, no one discloses to me when my son makes a covenant with the son of Jesse. None of you is sorry for me or discloses to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait as at this day. And so Saul is full of like this self-pity that in all of his jealousy, all of his rage, all of his unjust homicidal right, tendencies, he's like, no one feels sorry for me, <laughs> right? He's, he's so focused on his own heart, his own kingdom, his own little world that he doesn't care about anyone else. He doesn't care about being faithful to the Lord or faithful to care for his own people, his own nation. And so all of his soldiers, right, they're just kind of, you know, being accused of conspiracy. But then answered Doeg the Edomite, who stood by the servants of Saul. He says, I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob, to Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub. And he inquired of the Lord for him, and he gave him provisions and gave him the sword of Goliath the Philistine. And so not only did the, the priest uh, give David provisions and the weapon, but he also prayed to the Lord for David's behalf, right? So he was seeking God's will for David's life, and Doeg lets him know this. And so then the king sent to summon Ahimelech the priest, the son of Ahitub, and all his father's house, the priests who were at Nob, and all of them came to the king. And so he summons this entire city of priests to him. And Saul said, Hear now, son of Ahitub. And he answered, Here I am, my lord. And Saul said to him, Why have you conspired against me, you and the son of Jesse, in that you have given him bread, and a sword, and have inquired of God for him. 
so that he is risen against me to lie in wait as at this day. And so now there's this accusation, and notice it's not just Ahimelech that's on trial, but his entire household and his entire city is under threat of this maniacal ruler right now. And he's making these accusations. He says, you've conspired against me with David in this way. But at this point, remember, Ahimelech didn't actually know. He didn't know what David was doing. And so, verse 14, Ahimelech answered the king. And he said, and who among all your servants is so faithful as David, who is the king's son-in-law and captain over your bodyguard and honored in your house? Is today the first time that I have inquired of God for him? No, let not the king impute anything to his servant or to all the house of my father, for your servant has known nothing of all this, much or little. And so he's, he's trying to like reason with Saul. He says, listen, I, like who's more faithful than David in this whole kingdom? Am I not to help anybody ever? Because David is clearly, right, the most faithful person He's cared for you. He's fought battles for you, right? He's done all of these things for your kingdom to remain. We would have been slaves had he not slain Goliath. And he's like, so how am I supposed to know who I'm allowed to help? If I'm not to help David, the most faithful individual, like who can I help if you're going to accuse me of conspiracy? And he says, like, this isn't even the first time I've helped him. I do it all the time, right? David had already had this heart for the Lord since he was a shepherd boy, and apparently he was spending much time as well in the tabernacle, seeking God's will for his life. And Ahimelech saying, listen, Saul, I've done this before. Like, how was I to know that today was any different? And the king said, verse 16, you shall surely die, Ahimelech, you and all your father's house. And the king said to the guard who stood about him, turn and kill the priests of the Lord, because their hand is also with David. And they knew that he'd fled and did not disclose it to me. But the servants of the king would not put out their hand to strike the priests of the Lord. And so now slowly Saul is losing control of his kingdom. His own soldiers are defying an order to kill these priests. Out of their faithfulness to the the Lord, their recognition that this would be a great sin to slaughter the innocent, right? And they're, they're beginning to probably in their own hearts recognize that David is a better man, a man full of integrity, a man after God's own heart, and King Saul is not to be trusted. Who is he going to go after next? He's already accused them of conspiracy just a moment ago. And so none of the soldiers of Israel obey the order of the king. Right? This is godly disobedience. But then the king said to Doeg, you turn and strike the priests. And Doeg turned and struck down the priests, and he killed on that day 85 persons who wore the linen ephod. And Nob, the city of the priests, he put to the sword, both man and woman, child and infant, ox, donkey and sheep, he put to the sword. And so this is just this dreadful slaughter that takes place. Because King Saul is so jealous, so full of rage, right, so homicidal that he kills an entire city of his own people because of his belief that they've conspired against him with David, right? This is complete injustice. This doesn't make any sense. And not only did he kill a city of his own people, but these were the priests. This is the very place of the tabernacle where God's presence dwelt. And he chooses to slaughter them all mercilessly. David actually writes a song about this in Psalm 52. And this is what he sings. And I don't know, is this about Saul? Is this about Doeg the Edomite? And in some ways, is it even about the sin that David sees in his own life? He says, why do you boast of evil, O mighty man? The steadfast love of God endures all the day. Your tongue plots destruction like a sharp razor, you worker of deceit. You love evil more than good, and lying more than speaking what is right. You love all words that devour, O deceitful tongue. But God will break you down forever. 
He will snatch and tear you from your tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living, Selah. The righteous shall see and fear and shall laugh at him, saying, See the man who would not make God his refuge, but trusted in the abundance of his own riches and sought refuge in his own destruction. But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God, I trust in the steadfast love of God forever. I will thank you forever because you have done it. I will wait for your name for it it, it is good in the presence of the godly. And so David sings this song that is partly full of mourning. Uh, It's partly a prayer for justice against the wickedness done against this city of priests that had been slaughtered, right? And it's this recognition like, okay, like some of this maybe was even my fault. Right? I had led Saul to this city and he killed all of these people because they helped me. And David's probably wrestling through all of this and right, struggles with the injustice that he sees in this world. But he reminds himself that God will one day make all things right. That God will take people who are merciless and never repent and bring them to justice. And that those who trust in the Lord will continue to grow that the steadfast love of the Lord will, in fact, endure forever. And so imagine like the conflict in David's heart when he would hear this news, that he's brokenhearted that, that these events took place, that it's at his time among the nation of Israel that are supposed to be representatives to the world of God and his love for humanity. They're supposed to bring the blessing of Abraham to all the families of the earth. And they are slaughtering one another, right? This is heartbreaking to David, but even in the midst of this suffering, David recognizes that God is at work and that God is not done. And in fact, not everyone was killed. In verse 20, back to 1 Samuel, it says, But one of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, named Abiathar, escaped and fled after David. And Abiathar told David that Saul had killed the priests of the Lord. And David said to Abiathar, I knew on that day when Doeg the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul, I have occasioned the death of all the persons of your father's house. The New Living Translation says, I have caused the death of all your father's family. And so even though the sin did not belong to David, right, he recognized that he had brought this wrath to this city that was pursuing him. I imagine like he's probably thinking like, who can I ever go to for help again? If it's going to bring Saul's destruction on them wherever I go, right? This is going to be so hard for him to deal with. But he realizes this, this young priest has fled. His entire family had just been killed and comes to David. And this is what David says in verse 23. He says, stay with me and do not be afraid. For he who seeks my life seeks your life. With me, you shall be in safekeeping. And so David chooses to to take this priest into his little cohort, his little army that's building, and he's going to take care of him. And so at this point, David's little king's court is being built. He's got the support of Jonathan the prince. He's got Michal the princess. He's got Samuel the prophet. And now he has Abiathar the priest that uh, Saul is losing control. He's lost all of their support. He's lost the support and obedience of his own soldiers. And David is slowly building up this little kingdom. And so this is a really sad story, right? It's this slaughter of the innocent. An entire city is killed. And they were innocent of everything. They were faithful to their nation, to their God, and even to their king. But Jesus actually thinks back on this moment and he celebrates the mercy that was on display even in the midst of the mercilessness that we might right, most dwell on. In Matthew 12, this is Jesus' New Testament, and this is right, some of the best way you can get commentary on the Scripture is read what the Bible says about itself. Because so often, right, later letters, later prophets, later epistles reflect on the truth of God's Word and might give clarity under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so in Matthew 12, let's see how this relates. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. 
And so the Sabbath is the key part here. It's, the, it's Saturday. It's the day of rest for the nation of Israel. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain to eat as they are walking. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. And so notice, they're not complaining about stealing. That's not the accusation that's being brought up here. All right, the, the disciples are actually allowed to eat the grain from fields as they walk by. And it's not just because they're followers of Jesus, but this was actually part of God's design and mercy that he had towards the poor and the wanderer. In Leviticus 19.9, he actually wrote this law in the Old Covenant, the law of Moses, and he said this, when you reap the harvest of your land, so if you're a farmer and you own a field, he says, you shall not reap uh, right up to its edge. Neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. Anything that you drop as you first pass through your field, you leave it. It's not yours anymore. And you shall not strip your vineyard bare. Neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. And so God has designed this neat little welfare system for his nation in which if you're poor, if you're hungry, you can always get up and go to a field during harvest time and you have access. You can walk along the edge and that, that edge of the field is meant for you. That's God's grace and mercy towards you. Or even after the harvesters have initially gone through, anything that's left on the ground or anything that ripens after the fact, that's also God's grace and mercy towards you. He says this in Deuteronomy 23, another book of the Bible, a retelling of the law. He says, verse, uh, 20, chapter 23, verse 24. He says, if you go into your neighbor's vineyard, you may eat your fill of grapes as many as you wish. This is for all the people of Israel. But you shall not put any into your bag. If you go to your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the ears with your hands, but you shall not put a sickle to your neighbor's standing grain. And so part of God's mercy for his people, his care for the poor, is that when you're walking along, you can eat the food that you need that that's part of God's provision for the nation, for the poor, and for the sojourner. And so that's not what the Pharisees are complaining about. They're complaining about the idea that by taking a handful of grain, that's considered work. That's labor. That's not resting on the Sabbath. That's not keeping the Sabbath day holy. And so now Jesus is going to answer this accusation in verse 3. Back to Matthew. He said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? And those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which is, it is not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. And so Jesus says, this moment of my disciples, without home, without place to lay their head, being hungry, they can gather food, yes, even on the Sabbath day, right? They're not, they're not harvesting a whole field. They're just taking handfuls to fill their belly. And, and he said that this is allowed. Verse 5, he gives another example. He says, Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath day the priests themselves in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? He says the priests are working on the Sabbath day in order to serve the nation, in order to read publicly the scriptures to the people. Right? That, but that's not profane, right? That's not guilty of sin, so to speak because they're doing what God's instructing them. That's his desire, that's his design. Because bringing the word of God to the people is a good thing to do on the Sabbath day. And notice Jesus uses the word guiltless here, and he's going to use it again. He says, verse 6, I tell you something, greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And so Jesus reflects on this moment in which David was hungry and Abiathar the priest fed him, right? And took care of his needs and his men. It was a moment of mercy that he did that. He didn't uh, strictly adhere to the traditions, but he recognized someone hungry, someone starving is more important that I need to give them food, that this is a godly, loving, merciful thing to do in this moment. And Jesus kind of is accusing the Pharisees that you're being merciless. 
that less like the priest in David's day, you're more like Doeg the Edomite. You would choose to, to, to let them die than to show them God's mercy and grace. And when Jesus says I, uh, this phrase, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, he's quoting from the Old Testament. He's quoting from the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, in Hosea 6.6, 6, which says this, For I desire steadfast love, right, mercy, and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. That, that God's desire is for us to be people that receive his mercy and share out his mercy. That God's desire is not that we would simply uh, obey traditions and, and rote sacrifice and offerings, right? That, that he wants us to actually know him. That he wants to be known by us. That's what God desires. And it's possible to, to worship God while having your heart far from him. And so that's something that, that Jesus is hearkening to. The prophet Hosea is, is pointing out to the people, God loves mercy. God wants to be known. God wants relationship with you. And it's not about like particular nitpicking and law keeping. And this is actually not even the first time that Jesus quotes this verse about mercy. In Matthew chapter 9, this is when he goes and has a feast. He eats at the house of a tax collector. And the house is full of all the most sinful people of that town. And the Pharisees get word of this, and they're asking the disciples, like, how, if Jesus is holy, if Jesus is a good teacher, like, he shouldn't be amongst tax collectors and sinners. And this is what they said. Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he, that is Jesus, heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. And so, so Jesus is, is setting the case. He's saying, listen, I've come to demonstrate the example of God's heart towards humanity, that he's offering mercy towards those who are guilty, that he's making a way for relationship and making a way to be known, available. And Jesus is going to go after those who recognize the fact that they're sinners, who recognize the fact that they are the sick in need of healing. And Jesus is going to spend time amongst those who are humble and able to receive the grace of God. Now, it'd be possible that someone reading this might think, so Jesus is just getting rid of the law. Jesus is just saying it doesn't actually matter if you ever sin. There's no such thing as sin, right? Just go be kind to people. That's what I want you to do. But that's not actually what's taking place. Because even when he's at that party and he talks about being a physician to the sick or calling sinners, he still calls them sinners. He's acknowledging the fact that there's such thing as sin. He's willing to make an example of David and the priest and an example of mercy, but at no point does Jesus say, hey, remember Doeg the Edomite, how he slaughtered all the priests? That's fine. There's no such thing as sin. Right? Like, Jesus didn't use Doeg as an example. There still is injustice. There still is sin. And Jesus still is one that holds that line and invites us to forgiveness and freedom from sin. In fact, Luke's rendition of that same account in Luke 5.32, Jesus says this, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He doesn't call us to remain as we are, but to change our minds, to turn our hearts, to follow him. That we wouldn't be like King Saul, so focused on our own pride and selfishness and jealousy and rage, but we would have mercy towards other people. That we would set aside, we'd lay down our own sin and go after Christ. Right? That's what we're supposed to do. Jesus called sinners, yes, but he called them to repent, which is good news. That's a good word for us, that we're not stuck in our sin, that we have opportunity to experience life and freedom in Jesus. And so, Jesus, uh, immediately after the Sabbath day issue, he goes and heals a man whose hand was withered, that was in the synagogue. And so they, they picked a fight over this as well. And one of the things that Jesus says, we'll jump down to Mark chapter 3, uh, if you could for me, David. He said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath day to do good or to do harm, 
to save life or to kill, but they were silent. And so Jesus is one who's willing to show mercy even, yes, on the Sabbath day. That's what Jesus chooses to do. And yet they would have withhold, withheld that mercy. And they pick a fight over the fact that he heals a man on the Sabbath day when they themselves, the Pharisees, will call for Jesus' death, will murder the innocent during something greater than the Sabbath day, during Passover week, right? Like they're willing to defile Passover week and murder Jesus. And now they're picking a fight with him healing someone on the Sabbath day. And so one of the things that Jesus says, he, he's basically saying, it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath day. It, you're allowed to do good things on the day of rest. But that is also in line with the heart and attitude of God. It's not a day for us to be sinful, to be wicked, no. But we can do good. Let's jump to uh, Galatians 22, 522, which is partway down. This is Paul writing. He says it this way. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Right? Jesus says that you can do good on the Sabbath day. Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says you can have an abundance of the fruit of the Spirit that the Pharisees aren't going to show up and be like, that's a little too much self-control. Or that, that's, aren't, isn't that a little bit gluttonous, that amount of, of kindness that you're showing? Right? Like, no, no, no. The, the Bible teaches us that under the inspiration of the Spirit, we are a people that we have no limitation on the amount of God's fruit that is on display in our lives. Right? There's no law against it. That others should be able to enjoy a harvest of the fruit of the Spirit from us in abundance, right? That the edges of my field, right? The gleanings of my field, I get to enjoy the fruit of the Spirit in my life, but also the rest of it's for everyone else around me. That's what God desires for us, that we are to do good on the Sabbath day. We are to have an abundance of goodness. There's no law against it. God desires that we would be merciful. In Mark's account of this Sabbath day argument, Jesus says, Mark 2, 27, that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. That God didn't come up with laws, and then he's like, you know what? I want to create humankind to have these really great law keepers. It was the other way around. That God created humanity, and then he gives laws. He gives boundaries because he's good, because he's merciful. That all of the things that God commands and instructs us are for our good and for our flourishing. Right? That's why God gives laws. And, and Jesus is saying the Sabbath day was meant to be a blessing, but they were twisting it into being a burden for the people around them. And in Mark 2.28, Jesus says that the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. That Jesus came in authority on the earth. He had authority in the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount to say, you have heard that it was written, thou shalt not murder, but I say to you. Or he says, you have, you have heard that it is written, you should not commit adultery, but I say to you. That Jesus was one who taught with authority. He was able to teach us the meaning of the law so we could rightly understand what they're saying. And Jesus is the Lord of, yes, even the Sabbath day. He could tell us what its intention was, why God gave it, that it was meant to be a blessing, to give us rest so we would have time to spend with the Lord and with his people, right? That this was a good thing that God had given. And the reason he can do that is because he is the son of man, which is actually a claim to deity that Jesus makes. The son of man is a title found in Daniel chapter 7. And it's about a man who is to be worshipped, who sits at the right hand of God. And that Jesus is saying, he's declaring, I am God, when he says this phrase, which really upset the Pharisees. And just as we had read in Leviticus 19, God was able to give laws, and he ended those laws saying, you should do this because I am the Lord your God. Jesus is doing the same thing. 
He's more than just a good teacher. He's more than just a prophet. He's more than just a priest. He is God. And He's able to give us the truth and the meaning of these laws so that we can flourish and He can speak the truth with clarity because He is God. And so Jesus, I want to let you know, is God Himself. Jesus is the Son of Man, the Son of God, the Son of David, the Scriptures say. He is the reigning King over all the earth. Jesus is also the High Priest. Now, the priest in David's day gave his life in order to show mercy to make available to David the bread of the presence. And Jesus, our high priest, gave his life so that we could have the bread of life, that we could partake in the eternal life that's only found in him. And we now go and show that same mercy to others. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, that that your commands are not burdensome, that your yoke is easy, your burden is light, that you are available to help us in our times of need, that you are tremendously merciful towards us who are, in fact, guilty and are, in fact, sinners. But Lord, instead of bringing judgment against us, you chose to give your life so that we could experience mercy that we could experience your grace, that it would be overflowing in our lives, not just for us to drink and partake in, but for others to enjoy. And I pray, Lord, that we would just be in awe of what you've done for us. That, Lord, you've cared for us when we were hungry. You've, You've given us life when we were dead in our sins. And, Lord, you set us free from slavery to sin. You call sinners to repentance. You give them life, and I pray that we as your followers would not be people caught up in all of our anger, all of our jealousy, all of our selfishness, but we would set aside our own kingdoms. We would set aside our own agenda, and Lord, that we would seek you and your will for our lives, that we would recognize you as king on the throne of all the earth, and Lord, that we would seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.